I'm Mary Sheely, and I wanted to introduce myself as the president of the Ballard Historical Society and give you a little recap of what was a very important year for us. It was our 30th anniversary, our pearl anniversary year of being a historical society. We had a very ambitious year. We set out to do a public event each month for the entire year of 2018. Thank you very much to Marguerite and our special relationship here at the Sunset Hill Community Center. Three of those months were filled with our film series where we showed, curated by Marguerite, various movies filmed in Seattle with special portions filmed in Ballard. We also did our heart-bombing event, which we do every Valentine's Day. It's part of the National uh, Historic... Every, the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And they put it on where you choose a building to honor. And this year we chose Hattie's Hat in Ballard, the longest contiguously running restaurant in Ballard. Uh, we also held all kinds of events, two more that I'll just let you know about. One was our birthday party. We had it at Hattie's Hat, and it was a celebration that included an art show by artist Matt Baysmore and music by the Low Bar Ramblers, a local uh, Ballard group. And then our final big push in September was to try something new. We did a Tweed ride. This is a bicycle ride done in Tweeds on vintage bicycles. We took off from the Ballard Bell in costume and we rode down to Golden Gardens where we proceeded to have a beautiful tea on a sunny day in September in our fancy togs. And then we rode back and some of us had brunch, guess where, at Hattie's. <laughs> so that was a lot of fun, and now here we are at our wonderful Christmas celebration, which is also a beautiful time for us to have not only a presentation, but a really quick little matter of housekeeping, which is this, this is our annual voting meeting. So with that, I would like to introduce you to Chris Royer Collins, who will come up and quickly put us through our voting process. Thank you, Mary. Um, so there are a number of trustees around the room, and I'll have them stand. Um, this uh, voting process happens once a year. We need a quorum of members. Um, I think we probably have that, um, but we'll see hands raised in a minute. So I'm going to read the minimum um, uh, slate that's required by the state. Um, that So we have four of those trustees, and those are, I'll ask you to stand. Better? Is that better? Oh, I'll ask sorry. you to stand. Um, Mary Sheely, Sue Griffith, Leslie Cook, and Kaz O'Callaghan. Those are treasurer, but uh, not in this order, president, secretary, treasurer, and vice president. Um, so this is the slate that we'll be voting on in just a second. Um, we also have three trustees at large. Um, those are Davija Spurzik, Laura Cooper, and myself, Chris Royer Collins. So I'm going to call for a vote now, um, and I'll have the members raise their hands. So all in favor of approving this slate for the following year, please say aye and raise your hands. Thank you. That was pretty easy. <laughs> that was pretty easy. But in uh, interest of having others of you in the room raise your hands, we're always looking for volunteers who have technology skills, word site or word or web website skills like WordPress, and then also uh, this coming year we'll have our every three year um, classic homes tour. And a lot of people like to be docents. How many of you have been docents on the tour? Okay, so that's where you stand inside a lovely house and you help guests and you, you chat with them and, and so on. Um, but we'll be needing volunteers for that, and that's um, in June. What's the date? 23rd. 23rd. 
Sorry, Sunday the 23rd. Thanks, Sunday the 23rd. Um, in the meantime, we'll have another lecture um, right here, and that's February 10. It's a Sunday, an unusual day for us, um, but maybe that means more of you can come. And it will be Richard Miller, um, who will talk about the author Fust Foss tugboat that's now on South um, Lake Union for all of us to enjoy. Um, but he was the project manager for restoring that, so that's in February on a Sunday. So thank you for um, participating in the vote. And I would like to um, now have a special celebration for Mary Sheely, who was up here a minute ago, to, who coordinated a lot of the events um, for the 30th anniversary. So round of applause. And <laughs> Introducing their compendium, their new book, their new publication, Seattle Now and Then, The Historic Hundred. So usually at these um, Ballard Historical Society functions, I like to dress in Edwardian, an Edwardian outfit, or perhaps something from the 30s. But I don't know how many of you saw this article <laughs> in the Pacific Magazine, 1968 where Paul Dorpat is rocking a saffron robe. And I thought, I'm going to pull out my Marimekko <laughs> and celebrate the 70s. Because I figure at this point, we can celebrate many, many decades of Seattle's history. And um, thanks to... Turn around, would you? <laughs> <laughs> thanks, to... <laughs> thanks to Paul and Jean, we... Um, we, the public at large, have been educated for decades now on Seattle's history through their um, column in the Seattle Times, Now and Then, Seattle Now and Then. And uh, it's been going for so many decades. Oh, and for those of you, is anyone unfamiliar with that column? Basically, okay, there's a, um, there's a then photo of Seattle, and then there's a now photo of Seattle taken from the same vantage point, and then some um, explanation of, or a story about what has happened in that place in history. So it's been very That's useful. That's an ambitious description of what it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been wonderful for those of us interested in Seattle's history and preserving Seattle's history. And they've been doing it for so long at this point that I'm wondering whether they have yet used any of the early now pictures as a current <laughs> picture. I don't know if they have yet. Maybe they'll let us know tonight. So please join me in welcoming Paul Dwarfat and Jean Shira. Thank you, Jean. We'll give uh, our joint thanks. We're going to use one microphone? No, oh, one's two. One's enough, but two. All right. Gene, uh, put together this show. Let's check and enter. This one is, we're going to make sure this one is working. Is it working? There's a, no, there's working. There's a switch on it. Switch. The microphone has a switch. Uh, let's see, there it is. I guess okay, this Okay, uh, now it's now. Uh, this uh, historical group needs some more engineers, doesn't it? So <laughs> sign up. Yep. Uh, and rich ones are even better. <laughs> so, you guys are, we're counting now. I think you're our 19th show. 20th. 20th show. Oh, the big two zero. We started on Paul's birthday on October 28th, and we, we never looked back. <laughs> and so, you can join in now, and let's sing Happy Birthday to Paul. Here we go. Happy birthday to you. Wait a second. Happy 
Yes, we do. Here we go. Let's see if we'll start here. Here's a surprise. <laughs> With your host, Ralph Edwards. Yeah, no, it's, it's not coming through the... Oh, I know why. I've got to put this on. Give me just a second. I can put it on the, the laptop speakers at least. Hold on. No, I got it. I'm fine. We could sing the happy birthday song again. <laughs> How many of you have here at, at, birth, at your own birthdays within the last two months? Raise your hands if you had your own birthday last month. My yeah. birthday is the same day as yours. What's that? October 28th. Oh, oh the same day. Oh. <laughs> 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 I think you saw it was on mute. What's yeah. that? I think you had it on mute. There it goes. There's a little Photoshop cut and paste. Well, let's go forward now. And this is Paul in the war years. 1942. This is in Grand Forks, North Dakota, backyard of the uh, Lutheran Church, uh, 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 you know, the home where the preacher lives. The manse. The parsonage. You know, we Presbyterians called it the manse. We, we, we actually whispered about you doing that, and we said, well, let's keep with Parsons. Well, Paul has maintained his fascination with guns and flags, but uh, let's go for it. He actually has them at all. But what is that hat you're wearing? I don't understand uh, that. It's a helmet with uh, camouflage. Oh, what is it? <laughs> camouflage, <laughs> but with the striped Charlie Brown shirt. My that <laughs> is a... <laughs> My older brothers. Uh, that's lovely. We go forward, we see Paul as a baby, and here he is, and there he is sitting on the lap of his eldest brother, Ted, and the handsome one, up right, that's Norm, yeah, and who's this? Isn't he, no, wait, let's pause with him. Isn't that guy beautiful? <laughs> you have to admit, isn't he beautiful, the upper right one? Yeah. 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 The boy, the final brother. really yeah. resented that. <laughs> and then on the upper left is David. All right, let's look at them today. Well, 15 years ago in the picture I took of the four brothers standing side by side. <laughs> and Paul is the only remaining door pad yeah. of this generation. Yeah. Wearing his Mama Lil's t-shirt. <laughs> How many of you had Mama Lil's peppers in your life? Oh, we have some fans. Yeah. Quite a few. Now well, we're going to... Now we see Paul with his father, Theodore Dorpat, the Reverend Theodore Dorpat, uh, a good Lutheran pastor, moved to Spokane. How old were you? Six. Six in Spokane. And there's his mom, Cherry Dorpat. What was her actual name? Edith Arena. Edith Arena. What's going on here? Let me see. Oh, just right in the... Edith Arena. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wait, is this boring you, this family talk? <laughs> no? Okay. No, it's, this is leading to the life of Dorpat. And so we'll, we'll be out of this real soon. It doesn't take long. We'll go through now, and many of you may remember the Helix. Paul was the founder and editor of the Helix. Yay! How many uh, were there that, how many delivery boys and gals uh, for the Helix in the room? Did anyone deliver the Helix on the Ave and downtown? I stole it and took it to Bainbridge. Oh. 
Well, I used to take pages from its, the back cover and put them on my wall when I was 10 and offend my mother. <laughs> and and here, you became friends with her later on. I did. Yeah. And, late, and so this is uh, as part of the, uh, another mission of, of, of the Helix was, and Paul's was to promote wonderful music. And look at this lineup at the uh, Sky River Festival in 68. I mean, you've got Ramblin' Jack Elliott, you've got Santana, you've got Muddy Waters, you've got, uh, uh, I mean, this is a crowd. And it was the first festival in the world on a farm multi-day, a year before Woodstock. Did they steal it from you? No. Uh, I think they didn't know about it, but they certainly didn't steal it. A whole bunch of them happened right then. We just happened to be the first to really do it. Uh, what's that? You got that off that six dollar, man. Are you kidding me? Speak up, please. They were, they're saying that the, you got ripped off with the six dollars. Nobody paid. That was the other thing. <laughs> Because there was no way really to keep people from just walking in, and so we gave up. And uh, what money was made was given to local charities. Uh, there was no real intention to make money anyway. But we did have to pay for some airplane flights, so that went into it. And here's the picture Laura was talking about with Paul and Tom Robbins and his Saffron Road. Some of those airplane flights came on their own, kind of late, like the Grateful Dead. They came in on their own dime, flew in, played. Uh, Country Joe and the Fish came late. They had done a concert in Los Angeles, in uh, New Orleans. So we had a hell of a time. And I think, uh, were you there? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Were any else, others of you there at that festival? Anyone go to 10 Sky River? There's a couple in front. We're, we're, we're looking for attendees who were in this following photo here. <laughs> we, we haven't found any yet. You're on the hill? Yeah, I'm on the hill. No way I'm going down there. <laughs> <laughs> well, the sun came out for a couple hours, uh, you know, in the midst of this rainstorm, and it, but it is a great, a great photo of the Mud River. You know, we can do it now and then on this. We should. What is it? This is 68. Yeah, we're, we're right there, it's 50 years. Okay, so let's go forward now to the next step, 10 years later in Paul's life when he becomes our public historian. It begins primarily, it's the, the, the outreach really began with 294 glimpses for 294 cents. Penny a picture. Penny a picture, another non-profit effort, but we sold... <laughs> We should have been, we could have been profit and got rich. We sold 40,000 of these. 40,000. Any of you got these in your library? One, a couple of you. That's interesting. Isn't it? Three of you, yeah. Well, after the 284 glimpses, within a few months, Paul began his first column at the Times and developed a, a, a relationship with folks like Skid Road writer Murray Morgan, who became a, a mentor and a good friend. Fine fellow, fine, fine fellow. And he started to interview, and this is, I love this photo because it shows an aspect of Paul which I see all the time in my house when he leans forward and asks me deep and searching questions and I can't answer them. <laughs> but in this case, he talked to Lucy Campbell Coe who was a witness to the Seattle fire when she was a child. And along with another three women, uh, that the, who's uh, who, whom he interviewed about the fire. No men, though. No men survived long enough to talk well, about. I didn't it. necessarily interview about the fire, but I interviewed them, and they were old enough that they mentioned three the more of them remembered the fire. That just mm -hmm. that quickly fled. So this is our little uh, our piece of advice: interview your elders. Do it today, or tomorrow, or this weekend. Here we are in 2011 at the Mohai show that Paul and I did together with our friend Berenger Lamont. We filled up their largest auditorium in the old Mohai with a show of statewide and city now and thens. And Berenger came over with repeats of old photos from Paris, a number of which were taken by Paul when he was 16 years old. And it was 
and had actually spent uh, a week or two in Paris as a member of what the YMCA Traveling Youth Corps? What was it? Uh, we were related to YMCA, but it wasn't YMCA. Don't confuse me. But we didn't pay much attention to it anyway. We just went out and and, and uh, searched through Paris. You know, we and took pictures. I, I don't remember going to a single meeting <laughs> at that uh, in, at that event. Huh. But Paul took some marvelous photos, and we actually featured a couple last summer when I took a group of kids to yeah. Paris and London. Well, Berenger is, uh, here she is with us standing on the back porch. And now we're going to flip back in time and I'm going to show you as the last little installment of Paul's biography a, a rather remarkable uh, event from 2005 when Paul first returned to Paris and we found something rather... This is the end of the monthly section. This is the end of the bio section, yeah. Okay, here we go. So watch the video. You might be able to just hear it. I'll put it starts to walk away and Baron Gere, a photographer that she says, I've got to get a picture of this. So she sends him back. <laughs> Two things happen. I start laughing so hard the camera is jiggling up and down. But when finally it gets settled, I want you to watch the expression that they give me. Never ha I've never met my doppelganger. Yeah. Has anyone here? I'm curious. Have you ever met an, um, a twin you were not aware of? Like someone so exact that they just... Did you get it on video? No. That, it, it's, it's worth it because we look back at this and I still... I, I've seen it dozens of times and it still shocks me. But here he is. And Berenger went back to the to central Paris and... and and found this guy several years later, and he was <laughs> an Orthodox Romanian priest. And here he is. He's, his church was was uh, was restored to some glory, and, and he won a, a major award, architectural award. The church did, but I just think he still he wears his glasses in the same way. And, they, you, you have the same uh, taste in, uh, in headwear. <laughs> Bibi tells us that he was amused too. And uh, actually, Bibi lives in central Paris, so I don't know that she did any specific exploring. She just felt, unless you know different, that she would bump into him eventually. Yeah, I don't know. We'll have to, let's give her a call. Well, let's begin with our book here. And uh, what we did is, uh, it turns out Paul uh, has the 1,800 columns that he's written over the last nearly 40 years in his basement, in a drawer. And they don't exist anywhere else. We have someone who ever, Gavin, will you stand up? Gavin McLeod. Gavin, uh, come up here. Sorry, McDougal. Gavin McDougal, sorry. Gavin McDougall has been diligently copying every one of these 1,800 columns. Look at this, this hero. Look at it. <laughs> and we're slowly putting them online. They're PDF searchable, and so all this work that was doomed to disappear without this process, because sooner or later they were going to fall apart. Uh, Gavin has uh, has digitized almost all of them, and they're slowly being put up uh, on the blog, and they will be there forever. So, 
This is uh, since 1982, and nowhere else. You can't find them in the Seattle Times, you can't find them online, or in the uh, uh, library archives, they're nowhere. And what is that blog? That blog is pauldorpet.com. <laughs> Good call. Gavin is also the accountant and a kind of general manager for the, uh, the the dance hall up on Capitol Hill that's part of the Odd Fellows, where we used to have benefits a lot in the Helix years. And so he does a lot of dancing. And he dances very well. And today, uh, one of his dancers is here with him. Where, where are you? Uh, <laughs> Angel, where's Angel? You know, we'll put some music on at the end. And then you, can, you can demonstrate and lead us in dance. Yeah, we need to. We need to continue. Let's see. So we're going to start with Paul's very first column, which is of the 63rd Coastal Artillery returning from the First World War in 1919. A huge citywide celebration. This is at Fourth and Pike looking north and here's the city turned out and finery everywhere and uh, Paul published this, uh, the Times published this January 17th, mm -hmm. 1982 and my job is to go out and find some uh, repetition, particularly for the book but as much as I can for the column, something that reflects elements of the original and comments on it in, in one way or another. And what I found to repeat this one was about a, oh, almost two years ago now, Jan, uh, January 21st, uh, 2017, at that same corner. And that is the largest march in Seattle history, the Women's March. How many of you on that march? How many of you? Well, look at that. Isn't that amazing? We, we asked that question, you know, and we get a lot of people go on, on that march. Gene, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, it's fine. We did go up. There. So it's, it was, it, that's why it was the largest march, because so many people went. I know. I was missing that part. It's what we call making the plane obvious. Well, this is the photo Paul took in fall of 81 in preparation for the column. And you can see the barista down in front holding the photograph that appeared in the column. And there's the corner of 4th and Pike. And here it is in the book itself. And the way we've organized the book uh, is, uh, how can I say this succinctly and, and with clarity? The, the, the first column in the book is, this is, uh, follows uh, the succession of Paul's column and that it's also the first column that Paul wrote. The final column of the book is a column that was just published last summer. All the intervening columns are follow the publication date of the columns, not the chronology, but we, we thought best to just go along arbitrarily with the order in which the columns were published. So that's how the book is, is organized. So it's a, it's a perfect book for the couch or the toilet. Uh, you can flip through it. There's, uh, you can go back and forth, and you'll you'll find new and interesting things as you as you travel. So the paper is not that soft, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wasn't going to use it. <laughs> okay, this is uh, Gene. What's this? Well, this is the the deepest snow in Seattle history. It's 1880. And uh, looks like it's about five inches deep. <laughs> it, it doesn't look that deep, does it? Well, the buildings were taller then. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, so this is this is several must have been days after the snow fell. It fell for a week, and uh, <clears throat> 64 inches fell in that week. Uh, and so, tell us about these buildings. Okay, that's Jesper's Hall, which was the center of all popular events in town in 1880. And it's at the north, pardon me, the south uh, east corner of Cherry and First Avenue, which was then called Front. 
Behind it is Wyckoff, the sheriff's home, at Second and and the Cherry, and then up on the hill with its steeple sticking up is the Baptist Church at Fourth and Cherry. Yeah. And then you can keep climbing; you'll uh, go up the top of First Hill. Okay. Well, again, I try to go back and find something uh, in our contemporary scene, and I went back to the last. This is heroic. Yeah, it's a heroic. This is heroic. Yeah. He had a snow to, to duplicate. So I went back, and I, I do this whenever it snows, because we have a lot of snow photos to repeat. But I ran back to this corner, and I found this. <laughs> and I want to call your attention to that fire hydrant, because there's actually a little pile of snow right up on top. <laughs> so this is, a, this is later, too, just like the other ones. So yeah. yeah, later, looking at first a chair. Well, here we are down on the waterfront with Norwegian photographer Anders Vilsa. And uh, he, he was in Seattle for just a few years, uh, towards the end of the 19th century. And he took this, uh, this photo on the waterfront, uh, looking uh, south from Pike. And uh, uh, actually took a number of marvelous shots of the waterfront, uh, waterfront and Seattle environs. But what, what uh, after uh, uh, a few years, his wife uh, called him back to Norway and read him the Lysistrata uh, Convention. What was it? <laughs> well, actually, I think they returned to Norway together. Mm -hmm. And she told him once they got there. No sex. No, no, that's what that was, Lysistrata was. Yeah. No, no, she said. Uh, Contrary to what you think, we're not going back to North to, to Seattle. We're staying here. And so she won, and he never returned to Seattle. Well, interestingly, he became over the following thirty years, he became a national treasure of Norway, and, and his photography is still celebrated today. And we look at it in Seattle, and we we adore it as well. But this was, you know, this was before he was the. The, the, the great Norwegian photographer. Here's the same spot. I have these some, are kids. These are my, my uh, theater kids, the students. my students from last spring. And here they are dancing below the viaduct, which is also soon to be lost. Vilsa goes away, the viaduct goes away. And here's another Anders Vilsa, a little bit south. Uh, this is 1898-99, and it's Gold Rush. That, that period of time where the gold rush was, I think in a six month period, there were a hundred boats that left these, this port for the Yukon. And if you look here, you can see this sign that says, portable aluminum houses weight 150 pounds. That's the iron men of the Yukon who are carrying those 150 pound houses. And you can see, well, maybe when I was young. You could, I like this because all of the backs are turned towards us. They're all running for the Yukon. <laughs> Heading north. Heading north. And today, <laughs> there we are at Coleman Dock with the Marion Street pedestrian wow. overpass. Yeah. <laughs> and here's a 2015 stamp set, one of a set of stamps honoring Vilsa and his magnificent photographs of Norway. And uh, look him up, he really is staggeringly good. Looking down from the Smith Tower a year before the observation deck opened. And in the distance, the photographer captures something that ordinary civilians have not seen, which is from Second and Yesler, you're looking at Queen Anne and Lake Union. What a surprise. And there's Wallingford up there. And down below, you can still see there's the Rainier Club. Up on the hill, there's St. James, and there's the Methodist Dome. And up here, what's this? Queen Anne High School. There you go, Queen Anne High School. So keep your eyes on, choose a central portion of the photo, maybe the Rainier Club, and we're going to go to look from today's observation deck and see if you can find Lake Union in this photo. <laughs> but there is beautiful St. James.
Okay, guys, what's this? Yeah, well, what's the ship? You're from Ballard. You should know these things. <laughs> Monongahela. Oh, that, you know, that's such a wonderful name to, to say. Let's say it all together. Monongahela. 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 It's a vessel that was built, not originally named the Monongahela, it was built in Glasgow in the 1880s, and by this time in its life, in 1931, it is a foremaster that has been marooned in Lake Union for several years. They weren't using foremasting sailing vessels to cross, to ply the Pacific or the Atlantic. Uh, it was towed out from uh, before the cantilevers of the uh, uh, Aurora, George Washington Memorial Bridge closed, it was towed out and eventually sold to a Vancouver logging company and became a barge and then finally was left to rot. But today, we see, there's the bridge. Now, let me use this picture as an example of something. And it is of the um, frequently uh, really telling picture as quality of genes repeats. Here you see the beautiful bridge hanging over that flotilla of uh, playboats. In the distance you see the marvelous uh, skyline of Wallingford. I say that because I live there. And the lake. Now this is the kind of thing that really is so enjoyable throughout the book. And in fact, that's why we want to say that the book, you need to buy more than one copy. <laughs> because you've got some ancestors and relatives or something and living in, well, Peoria, Illinois, why not, you know, or Spalaka, the uh, Missouri. You need to get this book for them too. So, there you have. I made the point and I hope you can register, okay? Thank you, Paul. Now I'm gonna make my little confession here, which I waited for a long time and I never ended up on this, on a day with clouds like these. This is my replacement for the Monongahela. <laughs> That's as close as I could go. Well, that's, uh, you've never confessed that before, Gene. That's very brave of you. Thank you. Well, we're going to draw a connection between the opening of the Aurora Bridge and the Yukon Gold Rush. Because this is the telegraph key given to President Taft by George Carhart, who discovered the first ounce of gold in the Yukon and became a very wealthy man. He took 22 nuggets and decorated a pure gold key and mounted it on Alaskan marble and gave it to Taft. And Taft used it to open the Alaska Yukon Pacific, uh, our, our first World Fair, and in 1909. And later, it was used significantly in throughout a, a number of events in Seattle history and throughout the country by presidents. <laughs> But uh, and now sits in the Smithsonian. But it was it was used when the George Washington Memorial Bridge opened on February 22nd, 1932. And this is the crowd. And the story of this is that Roland Hartley, the governor, who was from Everett, was not a fan of the Aurora Bridge. He did everything in his power to to stop it and to speak against it. And, but when he stood on the dais watching the enormous crowds on either side of the bridge, he delivered a, a rousing speech in support of the bridge and proclaiming that he was in fact the responsible for it. And, they <laughs> praise him. and he went on at such length that uh, Herbert Hoover in Washington, D.C., poised over the Taft key at 2.57 in the afternoon, pressed the button, setting off in the middle of Hartley's speech, setting off the flags unfurling, the crowds rushing out onto the bridge, the fireboats below sending their streamers into the air, and Hartley never finished his speech. <laughs> so, and here it is today. To get this spot, you can't, you actually can't retake this photo uh, without, uh, in this case, my 21-foot pole because the trees that cover the hillside where the original photographer stood would all have to be cut down to be able to see anything but leaves and branches and stumps. So this is, uh, I have a 21 foot long extension pole that I can extend and mount the camera on top. And when people 
walk by, they say, what, what is that? And I say, it's the world's largest selfie. <laughs> Here we go. And there is Herbert Hoover at the moment pressing the key. Why the radiator, Paul? That's what I don't know where he is in the White House. The White House is notoriously cold, Gene. <laughs> yeah, it was no, really yeah. was this was February, yeah. No, so. Cold. so he's just he's hovering next to the heater because he's been waiting for Hartley. Yeah, it's cold there. Well, it was used once more before retiring to the Smithsonian by John F. Kennedy to open the second Seattle World's Fair. And we have in the book the story of young Paula Dahl, who was the nine millionth visitor to the fair. And you can see her happy parents. She was a VIP for the day, and her parents are delighted because they got to accompany her everywhere. And they gave her a big dog. And you can see behind her, her unhappy sister. <laughs> Today, Paula is a, an elementary school teacher in Issaquah, and she keeps the nine million sign on her wall and regales her students with the glories of her past. Where's the sister? Yeah. Home with the sock guy. Oh, yeah. This is the, uh, what is this, you guys? Huh? This is the 1889 Big Fire, June 6th, looking south on 1st Street, called Front Street then, over, over uh, Spring Street. Gene, what does it look like now? Well, it, it looks uh, almost the same. <laughs> we'll skip it then. Let's <laughs> Actually, the, 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 all of these buildings are about to about to burn up. The entire, all the scene in front of us is gone, and uh, thirty blocks were destroyed, as you all probably know. And today, we're looking down south from Spring and First Avenue. And then we go forward. Let's look at the after effects. A couple days later, we see. The room. This is the Occidental Hotel, Gene. Is it? Yeah. This is the front of the Occidental Hotel. Right. Right there. Huh, look at that. Well, let's see where the Occidental Hotel sat. Let's look at it today. Pay attention now. There it is. The same, the same front. Right well, there. You better point that out. I am. I'm pointing with my laser printer <laughs> behind you, right there. I you have that gun. You don't have this gun. You, oh, I can do that. Yeah, I'm, I'm pointing, yeah. trying to avoid eyes. Yeah. And what is this? What's that structure there? You all know what it is. Sinking ship. Well, let's take sinking ship garage. Sinking ship garage. That's right. And the Pioneer Building and the to our foreground and left. And so let's go forward now to 1908. We're going to jump a little bit, and we're going to look at that the rebuild of the Occidental, same footprint. This is the Seattle Hotel in 1908. Uh, the great Roosevelt's great, great white fleet, is that what this is? That, that all came yeah, into they town? Yeah, visited town that year, right? And they put bunting everywhere. Well, we lost the, the Seattle Hotel in, in uh, 1960, when was it, Paul? 61. 61, it was torn down and replaced with a, with a remarkable structure that we've just seen. Just named. And just named. And, but one, one little bit before we proceed is, of course, the loss of the Seattle Hotel uh, inspired a, a, a thousands of Seattleites. Uh, amongst them they were, was a very prominent one, Victor Steinbrook. And when the market came under threat, the Seattle Hotel became a rallying point to save the market. And Victor Steinbrook now has a park named after him in the north part of the market, north of the market. And so if we go forward, now Paul is going to talk to us about, oh, there we go, that's the. Well, it was controversial because, of course, we are a fairly progressive city. And a lot of people wanted to, uh, to save the old hotel and not tear it down. And this was particularly forthright when the 
construction for the sinking ship garage was revealed, and people said, what? You're going to put that in place of the hotel? No way. Well, the forces that be, however, prevailed. And the people who designed the, the garage also gave uh, tender and feeling uh, descriptions of how their garage would repeat some of the Romanesque qualities <laughs> of the historical neighborhood. Now you see the basket handle windows, uh, the tops of them across the way on the Merchant's Cafe building, and you see now look at the top of the sinking ship garage. <laughs> you see how they've turned the pipe in there? Yeah. You can go up on top of the garage on a mission if you like, and embrace it if you like. It's up there waiting for your for your tenderness, and at the same time, you can look across Yesler at the at the merchants at the merchants' cafe. That's where my study of Seattle began. Was right there. A friend of mine opened the merchants, and I agreed to help him study its history. And one day, Paul sent me up to actually look at the merchant merchants' uh, uh, building and and. You didn't trick me. You just had me stand up there and stroke those those little pipings at the very top, and look at the and and to to as a mark of respect and and acknowledgement of the sensitivity of the architecture here. Rare for to make things up like this before he did make that up. So here we are now looking at the market that was saved. This is 1907, very early on, and uh, of course, let's just jump forward and look at it today. What a beautiful place this is. And how fortunate, let's give a little hand of applause to Victor Steinbrook for saving the place. Thank you, Victor. Mark Toby. Mark Toby was involved. Well, Mark Toby donated uh, money from the sale of his book, for instance, and hung around the market and pushed for its uh, for its uh, and he drew it. And he hey, drew it, hey, yeah. Hey. Yeah. 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 There were a lot, actually, more than two people. There were <laughs> many thousands of. And you know about Victor Steinberg's role with the. Speak up. You know about Victor Steinberg's role, told to me by my father, uh, on the design of the Space Needle. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We're not Victor. Victor is a marvelous guy, and there's and there should be books written about him. And in fact, if you want to know about, if you want to know more about Victor, talk to Peter Steinbrook. He's, he will talk at great length with him. Where are we now? All right, this is really a test of this crowd here, Gene. Let's see how sensitive they really are. And really shout this out so Paul can hear it. Where are they? Where is this? Oh, we got in one. Who, who came up with the answer? Uh, <laughs> He read the call. <laughs> so that was it's Melrose Place, a little alley filmed, taken by uh, Werner Lagen, Langenhager. It is a it is a tough name. And he knew that the ditch was coming, and and he ran out and and took a number of photos of looking north and south along this alley, and they're both featured in the book. Probably mid to late fifties. Yep. There's a lot of his photos at the Seattle Public Library. He gave most of them to the library. He gave some to the Museum of History and Industry too. Well, where is this? Another guess. The courthouse. Not the courthouse. So it certainly looks like it could be a courthouse. It's a public work. You're right in there. It is a public work. It's a federal building. Post office, third and union. In 1908, this was erected, and uh, the the steps, when the street was lowered, the steps were made of chuckanut sandstone, the columns of chuckanut sandstone, and it only lasted for 50 years. Those those citizens of the time would say, "Meet me at the steps," and they were talking about these particular steps at third and union, and. Unfortunately, we don't say meet me at the steps today because it, in 58, the powers that be decided that it was just too dirty, covered with too much pigeon poop, and there was no way to clean it. 
The sandstone was porous, so they tore it down. Oh. And they replaced it with, well, there's no problem with porous sandstone here. <laughs> no, it's a, it's the glass curtain facade there, you yeah. know. Washed out easily. It was easily washed, that's true. There's no places for pigeons to poop. Or perch. And uh, it has been called the, the filing cabinet lying on its side, but uh, and a, a soul sucking structure in the center of Seattle. But otherwise, we kind of like it. <laughs> uh, shall we go on? Uh, sure. Yeah, thank you. Let's move. Hooverville. 250 of 500 houses taken from originally from the B.F. Goodrich building, which no longer exists. Port of Seattle got me up on a hoist, and I repeated this photo. And there's not so many inhabitants in this one. <laughs> you have to go a bit further. Did you point out the Smith Tower? Oh, I didn't. I didn't. But you all did. You all see the yeah. Smith Tower? Yeah. I think they cut. You can take a single answer for everybody. <laughs> I, I take it on faith, Paul. Oh, there are some who will be, they're always in the front row, even if they're four rows back. And you know that when you're an interlocutor. This is the last year of the, of the trolleys, or if you want to call them streetcars, from 1940 41. You can see FRE up here, the Fremont Baptist Church. Here we're at 34th in the corner of Fremont Avenue. What is that grid on the front? Is that a cow catcher? We don't know, but it, no, it, is a cow catcher. it does look like a cow catcher, doesn't it? Or bicycle rack. No, it's a cow catcher. It actually did save some lives, those things, you know. And I bet when you were a kid, you could... I bet you could ride on that thing if the streetcar, the trolley driver was, was a friend. Well, this is one of the last streetcars in the city, and certainly north of town, it was uh, downtown, they'd already been replaced by gasoline <laughs> engines and trackless trolleys. So I had to go back and find something to, to, to match the power of this final last trolley on the same <laughs> That's right. Two women walking abreast. <laughs> How many of you were in that parade? <laughs> <laughs> you know, someday we'll find that the same people who were in the mud shot, there's at least two or three in the parade. <laughs> now we're jumping down to the International District and not much has changed here. You can see what, what the building down the street that became the housing the Wing Loop Museum. This is the, in 21, this is the Go Hing celebration on King Street. Uh, six day festival, and you've got lion dancers and, and happy celebrants. And to repeat this, I went right out in front of today's Hotel Milwaukee, bringing the members of the Seattle Kung Fu Club and their master, John Leung, who has been teaching there since 1960 and was a teacher of Bruce Lee's. So, but he brought his entire club out onto the street and we were allowed to stand there for about 10 minutes and because this Seattle, West Seattle cop said it was okay. <laughs> and they do lion dancing every, every Chinese New Year and bring out, and we'll go from business to business. Where are we now? The backyard of, shout it out, let's hear some. <coughs> Fremont. Lake Washington? Arboretum, a little further south. Well, let's give them a clue that the, the water is from Lake Washington. Yeah. Oh, that's a ship. What is it? What Black is it? River. Say it again. Black. You got it. It's the Black River. Black River. Uh, when they lowered the lake by nine feet. Uh, raise your hand. Raise your hand. I think there were a couple we heard Black River being. Go ahead. Have an extra pastry. <laughs> well done. Black River 
by and large disappeared after the lake was lowered by 90 feet. No more expeditions down the Black River towards the Sound. Today, you might find it burbling up in a park in Tukwila or in culverts beneath Rainier Avenue South. And this is Ralph from the Brown Bear Car Wash. <laughs> These are the, the Brown, uh, my brother and sister, they lived, uh, their family lived southeast corner of Lake Union, and this is the bay at the southeast corner of Woods. In fact, this is a quiz for you. You see that, that trestle in the lower and the left back there? Okay, the question is, what is that trestle for? Huh? This is, we're looking southeast on Lake Union here, southeast. What, what trestle is what that? Did you say? I heard Sorry. East Lake. East Lake? Well, you got the, the lake part of it, right? West the West lake is right. Westlake. West 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 so all this is filled now, see? Oh. And the lake is on the other side of that trestle, even as it was then, you know, the, the south end of the lake. But this south uh, west corner is filled in. That's the old western mill there that uh, uh, David. Uh, Denny opened in 1884, 82, 83, 84. That, what's the ridge in the background? What, what would that be? Capitol, Capitol Hill, right. What? So is that like therapy? Let's take a look. <laughs> <laughs> I can answer that question with a click of a button. Uh, there we are, around Aloha, a couple blocks over from Fairview. And these are, uh, this is Tia and Liana Owen, the daughters of my next door neighbor, taken in 2011 for the Mohai show. And I went back and I thought, well, this would be a fun now and then. Let's bring them back six years later. And today, Tia and Liana, and Tia can drive, <laughs> which is terrifying. Roosevelt, Rough Rider. <laughs> Every show, every show, the big groan comes at the side of the clock. I guess that tells us something, Clay. This should be the first picture in the book. <laughs> Everyone loves the Kalakala. Well, this is the Kalakala, 1948. It's going from, it's filled with, with celebrants of some kind. They're, they're being towed through the locks just down the street from us. And here's, uh, behind them uh, is Lake Union, and they've just come down the ship canal, and, uh, but the, it's, it's a boat filled with passengers, and they're headed back to the sound, to the salt water. So, of course, the checkered history, later history of the Kalakala is, uh, is something we, we prefer not to talk about. <laughs> but Clay now is going to do his, uh, his explanation and, and uh, impression. Demonstration. Demonstration, yeah, here we go, Clay. Can you just hold the mic? Yeah, I'll hold the mic. Yeah, how many here uh, rode on the Kalakala? I'm sure there's some, oh look, there's about 10, 12. Well, I was in high school when I rode on it in 1967. It was the last month of its run. And I remember it so well because of the noise it made. Because um, when you, got on it and the motors started running, you felt like the walls were going to come in and it sounded like and it went all the way to Bremerton and back. A big hand for Clay. <laughs> also because Clay is not only our documentarian and PR guy, he's also the editor of the book and he wrote the introduction. So. Forty-eight. So this is a 12, 13 years after the boat was was released out onto the waters. So and of course, Kalakala means flying bird. Our Art Deco masterpiece, which had a single stroke motorcycle engine. <laughs> well, I had to go back to the locks and find a, a, a suitable replacement for the Kalakala. It took me a little while, and I, but I, I, I came up with this. Which is... <laughs> 
the USS Turner Joy. And the Turner Joy is a part of US history. It was the second boat, big boat, involved in the Gulf of Tonkin. The USS Maddox uh, and the USS Turner Joy uh, fought off uh, the first attack from some Vietnamese, North Vietnamese gunboats. But the second attack was the one that never happened and that uh, Johnson uh, engineered the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution based on that second attack that did not occur. So a big, uh, I don't know what to say about that, but it's a museum ship now in Bremerton. It too spent a month, 50,000, yeah. And here it is off the coast of Vietnam. And it was decommissioned in 82. Clay Eels also is a West Seattleite, and he went back to Salties. And uh, I'm going to quickly flip back to the picture of, you can see, this is the wheelhouse. And so that's all that remains, recognizably, of the Kalakala today. It's sitting outside of Salties, and he took a photo of the outside and then very wisely shot looking at the skyline. Now, what was wrong with this wheelhouse, Paul? Well, for the style of the boat, uh, which had wings, because it, after all, was a flying vessel, the wings made it difficult to signal to the, the uh, workers that were on the board on the deck. So they had to relay the information through a second person who stood outside the wheelhouse, so that you had the wheelhouse commander, then the person standing beside the wheelhouse, and on the deck you had the third person. So it was a very clumsy way of really uh, sending instructions having to do with deck work. You know, it reminds me, it's a, it was a thing of beauty, but there's there's design problems, which reminds me of a number of, of Frank Lloyd Wright structures, or the Seattle Public Library downtown. <laughs> Talk to a librarian about that. Or my kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> or your what? My kitchen. Or your kitchen. Yeah, mine too. I don't want to interrupt. Good point. This is just before the opening of the viaduct in 53, in the spring of 53. They, a car has not yet ridden on it, a public vehicle, a privately owned vehicle. But we have two gals dressed in lovely red coats, and we have the Smith Tower. We repeated the color red and the Smith Tower. <laughs> and I want to call attention to, we're going to lose this structure very soon, but I want to call attention to this, this building behind it, which was just about topped off when I took this photo in spring of 2017. And it's called the F5 building. Then it was still being referred to as the Mark as in mark of distinction. And the architect, uh, the, 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 the developer, uh, Eric Daniels, uh, commissioned uh, an architectural firm to create a building that had all the finesse, grace, and savoir-faire of his favorite actress, the Belgian-born Audrey Hepburn. And why? Let's take a look. We're going to first look at the building itself, looking down the street just a couple days ago, and there's the Methodist, our lovely Methodist domed church. And Paul and I and Clay really like this building. I, and, I, and I wasn't sure why until I knew that, found out that in the lobby and inspiring its, its construction was this photo. <laughs> Look at the hips. Look at the cant of the shoulders and the cigarette. That's uh, objectifying a skyscraper. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but I just think that's kind of, you know, in a building of sort of, you know, city filled with generic glass and steel, this one actually appeals for some reason. And maybe it's Audrey Hepburn. You don't, you don't see it in those pictures, but you know that building. It bends, right? And yeah. it's wonderful, strange things, yeah. Well, even as that body that they're looking at there did. Yeah. How did you take that photo from the viaduct? Oh, well, I, I have a son with a car, and the car has a moonroof. And uh, so I just kind of, I'm big enough that if I 
push myself through the moonroof. I can't get back down until I've taken at least four circuits. It's so painful to push up <laughs> shoulders and, you know. But he very kindly took me around three or four times and uh, managed to get the, the repeat. That's, but that's the, the story of uh, a willing participant and a moon roof is, is really handy. No longer, though, the photo can't be taken. It's already disappeared because of a, a lo elongated building built alongside the viaduct that, that has precluded that view. This is Green Lake, 1903, taken by Ash Curtis. And you can see there's the Olympics. And that's about all that remains from this prospect. Today, there are the Olympics still. And it took me. I love this picture, the way the crow glides across. <laughs> this is a couple <laughs> hours of standing here with a 21 foot pole. But no leg. Mm. Oh, this is like 70, what is this, 70? 70th. 70th, yeah. yeah. Well, I live about five blocks from here, so I should know. Well, this is how we get home from Whole Foods or from Safeway. You also go to Trader Joe's? I do occasionally. Karen is more of a Trader Joe's person. Well, here we are. This is the oldest structure still standing in Seattle. Some of you must know what this is. Where is it, first of all? Let's let's take some guesses. Alki. Yep. West Seattle. Alki. It's a it's a block away from its first its first location. Whose home is it? Whose home is this? Not Denny's. No. Speak up. Keep shouting it out. You you'll get there sooner or later. It's uh. Doc. You got it. Doc Maynard sold, exchanged his land in downtown Seattle for 320 acres or so, 320 or 340. Moved out to West Seattle and built a, a farmstead. His first house burned down. This was the replacement. And the, then the uh, Maynard Estates ended up selling it to these folks. This is from the 1890s. And the photo was given to Paul, or loaned to Paul, by a significant figure in our own Seattle story, Paul Lee. Well, I just saw Clay intercept uh, a, a guest uh, here back in the, you see that? The kind of outfit they wear in, uh, in France. The Gilets Jaunes. That's right. Yeah, this is Ivor Hagelin that had this picture in his drawer because it was his uh, grandparents who bought the property from, from Doc Maynard. So Ivor Hagelin's, oops, sorry, I'm going too fast. You pressed the wrong button, you never know. This is Ivor's mom right there in the white apron. That's her mom. It's her dad. And this is Snidely Whiplash. <laughs> <laughs> he actually brought a case against April, Ivor's mother, because Ivor's mother was the youngest of the of Ivor's uh, of the Hansons, and she took care of her two parents when you know in their last years. So they gave her a little more uh, property because of all the work she did, and he objected to that because he. He had uh, one of the daughters and had three children, whereas April at that point had no children. So she thought his claim to the money was greater than hers, but he lost in court. So is that boy on the right, is that Ivor? No. Yeah. On the right, the boy is uh, probably, uh, it's, he's related, and I know what it is in, in my notes. How's that? <laughs> Uh, Ivor had this picture in the top drawer. Maybe I already said that. It was one of the first things he showed to me when I visited him in his Pier 54 office. First time I visited him, he showed me this picture. Because you see, I had a reputation then as a local historian, and he wanted to share it with the historian. Stumped me. 
Well, let's look at it today. A block down uh, up 64th. It is unmarked. There's no plaque. There's no identification of the house itself. So you actually have to walk down the street to find this this house. And uh, from early 1860s, the oldest structure in Seattle. Here's Clay Eels wearing his signature red summer shirt. And these are members of the Southwest Historical Society, Southwest Seattle, uh, of which Clay was the director for five years or so. How many years, Clay? Five years or so. <laughs> and at the end of the street, a block away, north end, there is a plaque, but it doesn't tell you where the house was. So you have to go searching for it. It's, doesn't it deserve a plaque, Clay? Yeah, it says the street down in the last line, but it doesn't say the address. But you can find the address in the book. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we even give the name. Yes, sir. We, we supply the name of the. Uh, no, we don't. Just the address. Yes, we are. All right. Now we're coming in. We're we're creeping into the end. A couple more comparisons here, and we have. Well, we're we're getting, we're getting there. He's got his yellow yellow jacket on. No, no. Okay. So here we are looking at Princess Angeline, who happened to be monitored that by Catherine Maynard. And uh, this is Kiki Soblu, daughter of Chief Seattle. Wow. She's sitting on her porch of her shack down below Western, and it was a mystery as to the, the exact location of this shack and its porch. And Ron and Paul, Ron Edge, our uh, collaborator and, and uh, map expert and volunteer at Mohai, uh, and he and Paul went over a number of old photos, and Ron really put some work in. They compared stumps and eaves and shadows and a dog or two, and, and <laughs> they came up with a pretty close location. And I have Ron sitting right about where Princess Angeline was on... This is the Pike Place Market parking garage and the Fixed Mador building. And if you were looking to the east, and this is uh, uh, down the, the, up the street, north of the uh, Pike Place Hill Climb. But this is really the only little green belt that remains. And her, her, uh, her house sat just about in this slot here, which is open to the air still. And this photo is misleading in a sense. Uh, you can't just walk up and see this view. It's fenced off. But if you want to see it yourself, it's very easy. Just go to the market. Go eat at Lowell's restaurant and go up to the second floor and look out the window and it's straight down below. This was featured in the column last November and uh, so it's, and it neither, this uh, location uh, does not have a plaque either. Does Lowell's have two floors? Yeah. It does. Oh, that's right, there's little things up there. Mm. Yeah. Well, we're gonna, this is our last image in the show. And here we have Kiki Soblu again, sitting um, in what is now uh, a part of the Pike Place Market, and with First Avenue behind her. And we have an inset of Chief Seattle. And there's a reason we do this, because we, we actually repeated this photo with two direct descendants of both Kiki Soblu and Chief Seattle, side by side, and here they are. Mary Lou Slaughter and Ken Workman. And there and Mary Lou is the great 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 granddaughter of Kiki Soblu. And Ken is the great 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 grandson of Chief Seattle through his second wife. And they came out, uh, Mary Lou from Port Orchard and Ken from North Bend, and they, they're wearing Mary Lou's magnificent cedar shawl work. And uh, she's an incredible basket maker and 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 cedar hat maker and, and a real artisan. And uh, so they came out and they, uh, they posed for this photo. And Ken is here tonight, and I'm going to go to this next picture, which Clay took of me <laughs> taking the photo. And so there we are, and uh, people were giving us a wide berth for about 10 minutes. <laughs> we had no idea what was going on. Ken, come up and 
and tell us our and these are the words of my grandfather, Chief Seattle, the words that we weren't allowed to speak for so very long. But on this photo right here, let me get out of Want to sit on my lap? I'll sit on the bench. All right. So on this photo right here, where Gene was taking this, uh, this picture, he had uh, sat Mary Lou down on a, on a crate, and I was kneeling right there, and my knees were hurting as I'm digging into the ground, and I'm thinking, Gene, take the picture. <laughs> because there was all manner of traffic going around us. So there aren't very many people right here. It was packed, like you see some of the earlier photos in the book. And so I'm thinking, Gene, take the photo. There's people here, and there's cars going in and out. And then somebody bumped me on the shoulder. Not the shoulder, the elbow. And they pressed. And so it was with two fingers. It wasn't like a whole hand or anything like that. It was with two fingers. And I kept thinking, take the picture. <laughs> so finally he takes the picture, and I turn around and I look, and there's nobody there. And so I asked Gene, I said, hey, hey Gene, was, was there somebody here just now? And he goes, no, there wasn't anybody there. And so there's a great mystery down at Pike Place Market about Princess Angeline. And so when that happened, I went, okay. Because it wasn't, a, it wasn't like, a, like a twinge on my elbow. It was a push. And so I said, okay, that's good. We, we got the photo. <laughs> Thank you. I want to remind you, this is your chance to shake the hands of the great, 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 great grandson of Chief Seattle. He's right here. And sometimes when he's here, because we're going to go over and sign some books, he might just indulge and sign his own photo. And what a triumphant <laughs> would have been. In any case, we, we, uh, we urge you to take a look at the book. You might enjoy it. It's seasonal. It's ready for, for, for packaging and sending off to your relatives in Peoria or to take home. And uh, uh, again, if you want to see all of the original columns, which were photographed by Gavin uh, and turned into marvelous PDF files, they are already up uh, on the blog. You can, you can see Paul's original columns and original photos. Now they are then and then, of course. And you can see our updates. So thank you very much for coming. And uh, we'll see you after the show. Um, we don't know how many people you've inspired over the decades, but we do know that there are lots of projects going on in Seattle now that are trying to preserve our ever-changing city. One of them that the Ballard Historical Society um, embarked in a few years ago was to photograph every house over 50 years old so that we would have a snapshot or I should say 7,500 snapshots of what Ballard looks like at that time. And it's already changed in the last few years. Um, but we mapped it. It is also up, almost up or up on the website. And if you want to know more about that project, it's Mapping Historic Ballard back on that side of the room. I also want to let you know that um, in the article in the Pacific Magazine on 1968, it said that Paul lost his saffron robe. And so oh. we don't have a saffron robe for him, but we've got a saffron 
cravat. Oh. And thanks. Oh. You can wear that to our last three shows. For all that you've done. Thank you very much. That's really sweet of you. And we have one for you in oh the color of the midnight sky. <laughs> wow. Yeah. This beautiful book, and if you're so inclined, get it autographed by our lovely historians. Check out Mapping Historic Ballard, go get some more mulled wine, and celebrate the history of our city. Thank you. <laughs>